I need a bun.
okay so am i audible yes so please start the session a very good evening everyone and i hope you all are doing well welcome to the finance lecture series 2020 presented by i am kodiko many thanks for enthusiastic response on day 1 today we are honored to have with us professor sanjeev das for day 2 of the finance lecture series an expert in derivatives and risk so sanjeev sir is a william and jenny sir professor of finance and data science at santa clara university let's begin the session with the prayer thank you today's session will be moderated by professor anirban banerji professor in the area of finance accounting and control we extend a warm welcome to both now i would like to request professor banerji to take the session forward thank you yogakshem for your uh, very kind introduction it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, professor sanjeev rajendras to our finance lecture series as most of you know this year we have started the new pgp finance program at iim koigol as a part of the inauguration of this pgp finance program we have started this initiative of finance lecture series whereby we are inviting distinguished scholars as well as industry professionals to come and speak to our uh, existing students as well as other members so as part of that today it gives me great pleasure to invite professor sanjeev das Uh, as already mentioned by yogakshem he professor das is currently associated with santa clara university as a william and janis stay professor of finance and data sciences prior to that he is he has done his post graduate program from iim ahmedabad after that he has done his mphil and phd from nyu stern he also holds an ms in computer science from uc berkeley so without much ado i would like professor das to uh, you know speak to us regarding Thanks, uh, thanks, Anirban. I'll just share my screen and let me know that you can see it. Uh, is that visible now? Yes, it is. Okay, fantastic. All right. So I thought I would spend about thirty-five, forty minutes on uh, on a topic I've been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, this is goal-based wealth management. It's a uh, fairly old but revitalized paradigm in in managing retirement money over time and uh, i'll try and show you the differences between the traditional methods and these new methods uh, the the gbwm has been around for about 20 years but uh, there was no mathematization of it so the cognitive psychologists and behavioral economists have been suggesting this is a better way for people to manage their money but uh, by and large we haven't had any sort of real mathematical framework to make this actually implementable and workable Uh, so in a series of papers recently i kind of have been working on this uh, i've been working with daniel ostrov who's my colleague in the mathematics department uh, anand and deep are both the uh, senior people at uh, franklin templeton anand actually is in hyderabad and deep is here in the bay area and greg ross is actually a, a phd data scientist who works at credit suisse and uh, has also contributed to paper 4 so there are three papers uh, that are there and then there's a paper 4 with greg i'll talk broadly about all the papers as a whole i did send one of them to you which is paper number 3 so that's a good reference point if people want to read uh, read further on this 
Okay, so typically if you think of someone who's starting out, uh, you know, as an earner uh, or as a business owner, they have basically some sort of single goal that most financial planners tend to focus on, like you want to have a million dollars for retirement in 20 years. But usually people have multiple goals. They have lots of different things they need for daily life, insurance, uh, visits to grandchildren, trips. Then you want money before retirement uh, for everyday expenses, paying your mortgage, insurance, weddings, vacations, philanthropy, and so on and so forth. Okay, So there's a lot of different things that people might want to use their money for. So people usually don't have a single goal. They have multiple goals, and they could number in the hundreds. So I'm going to show you an algorithm that actually maximizes the probability of meeting all these goals over time, over a long horizon, uh, dynamically. So most of uh, uh, the optimization today is done statically year after year, but with multiple goals, if you take, let's say you spend more on a wedding uh, five years from now, then you have less for your goals that come after that five year period. And so there's a dynamic sort of time shift that needs to be taken into account when, when optimizing these things. Okay, so, so this is actually going to be part of uh, uh, you know, the new sort of phase of things. And Franklin has been very supportive of this research. So you'll probably see some of this coming out uh, you know, in, in, in the near future. Uh, most of these papers are actually on my website. So you can definitely read them later if you need to as well. So what is portfolio risk? Basically, it's the volatility of your portfolio, right? And this is something finance people understand quite well. It's the standard deviation of returns. And uh, this is what people focus on in wealth management today. They want to minimize risk and maximize the growth of the portfolio, the return on the portfolio. So that's very easy to understand. It's been done traditionally. And all of modern portfolio theory is focused around this idea of minimizing volatility and maximizing return. But there's an idea number two which is what we've implemented. And that idea is risk is also the probability that you want to attain your financial goals. Okay, so you could definitely maximize the risk return trade-off in idea one, but it doesn't mean you'll actually be maximizing the chance that you'll get to all the goals in your life. Okay, and that's the second notion of portfolio risk. Now, second notion fits better with an investor's view of the goals of their portfolio. It also uses language that an investor understands better. I'll make that clear as we, as we proceed, but it is also helpful for advising, especially robo-advising. So we're seeing a lot of automated uh, wealth management planning going on now, and it speaks the language of goals. And so having multiple goals and being able to optimize this whole thing is, is extremely helpful. The nice thing about idea two also is that it has a long run view and is not short term. Most of the time people look at their portfolio every year and say, did it outperform the index or the benchmark? And uh, you know, have that conversation with the financial advisor, but by and large, that conversation does not involve, are you actually on track to meet your long-term goals? And so idea two actually is a setting in which the long run view is taken into account. But what we want to do is not discard idea one. We want to keep that in mind and maximize the risk return trade-off but we also want to implement idea two. So how do you do both of these things with one algorithm? That's sort of the, the focus of the talk today. So what's different? We've got probabilities, not just standard deviation as a risk measure. This is very useful. And the reason is that when, as you've seen in recent times, the market has a big correction, people generally tend to panic. They call up their financial advisor and say, take my money out and I can't bear the risk anymore and so on and so forth. That probably is the biggest mistake you can make because you kind of sell out you know, when the market's low and then you try to buy back in when it's high. But in any case, how do you actually convince people that that's not the right thing to do? One of the things you do is you look at the probability of meeting their goals. So let's say they have a goal 20 or 30 years out to retire. And the algorithm says, right now you have a 98% chance of reaching your goal. If the market takes a big correction, obviously the portfolio value drops. And then that probability of meeting your goal might drop from 98% to 93%. And over the long run, the longer the horizon, the less that probability of reaching your goal tends to drop because it's dynamically optimal. And so it actually plays a different portfolio strategy to catch up. And so people are much more reassured when they look at the probability of reaching their goals because it hasn't dropped drastically. Whereas a 20% drop in the portfolio will only translate into a 5% drop, let's say in the probability of reaching your goals. And so it also is calming for people to realize that their goals are still mostly on track even though the portfolio might have taken a beating. It's long-term versus short-term. You get different portfolios. 
you don't make the same strategy choices as you would as before. And uh, also here, because Anirban and me might have very different goals, uh, we might actually have very different strategies. Okay, and, and so just maximizing risk return trade-offs generally tends to come up with more standardized portfolios for, for people who are similar or at least not even that similar. And whereas here, if our goals are completely different, we'll get very different portfolio strategies over time. It's customized to each investor, not one size fits all. We don't have to statically rebalance it. It's actually dynamically optimal. It's consistent both with mean variance, Markowitz optimal portfolio theory and behavioral portfolio theory. It's not glide path investing. So the, the state of the art today tends to be life cycle funds or glide path investing where what people do is they put you on a glide path where the amount of risk on your portfolio slowly comes down over time because as you get older, the notion is that you should be taking less and less risk. And so the equity bond mix is adapted to bring that risk down. What we're gonna show you is that our strategy is not dependent only on how old you are. It also depends on how much money you have and whether you're on track to meet your goals or not on track to meet your goals. And so it's actually dependent both on time and on wealth level and the goals. And so it's actually a little more complicated. So we call that a glide surface rather than a glide path not life cycle based. It offers, like I mentioned, a simple metric for over and under performance relative to goals, looking at the probability of reaching your goals. And it combines mental accounts. If you go to most of the robo advisor websites nowadays, they'll say, what's your goals? And you'll say, I've got a retirement goal. I've got an education goal for my kids to go to college. I've got a speculative goal and so on and so forth. And these are separate mental accounts. And what they do is they construct separate portfolios for each of these different goals. And this is clearly suboptimal because if you could actually manage all the portfolios in all the goals in one portfolio, then you'll do a lot better because when you handle them in separate portfolios, sometimes one portfolio is overperforming, the other one's underperforming and you have no way to sort of trade off the overperforming versus the underperforming ones. Uh, there are several things that point to disconnects between the way financial advisors think and the way their clients think. So when you ask people, uh, you know, which of your, when you ask financial advisors, which of your clients are most like, what, what are they most likely to look at? Performance of individual investments, the overall portfolio, advisors say 50-50. But when you ask the clients themselves, they actually say my overall portfolio is what I look at a lot more than my individual investments. And so there's lots of disconnects like that. And we try to sort of put these into, into, into the algorithm as well, okay? So if you're looking at goals, Brunel, Jean Brunel was sort of one of the fathers of goal-based wealth management. 20 years ago, he said, people generally have four tiers of goals. They have needs at the bottom, which they want to get with a very high level of probability. They have wants, they have wishes, and they have dreams, okay? And so the dreams can be obtained with a lower level of acceptable probability, whereas the needs become extremely important. And I'm gonna show you a very big example at the end for a major life cycle problem, which contains all these different goals and, and wishes. Uh, Franklin did a survey and focus groups in 2017, where we tried to figure out how different uh, people thought about their, uh, or how comfortable they were thinking about financial investment concepts. And if you ask them to think about correlations and so on and so forth and look at diversification that way, they actually a lot of them, 50% of them really didn't understand that very well because they're not trained as financial uh, investors. Uh, if you talk to them about benchmarks, they get it a little bit better but not that well. But if you talk to them about things like there's a 90% chance you'll re achieve your goal, everybody kind of understands that. And so it turns out the language of goal-based investing resonates better with investors as well, okay? So just to recap, the, the, the overall thing with GBWM is very simple. Allocate your portfolio to optimize the property that you meet your financial goals. All right, so that was sort of background. What I want to do is jump into a little bit of mathematics to show you how we can take Harry Markowitz's a Nobel Prize winning work and extend it to actually include the mathematics of goal-based investing without removing any of the features of Markowitz's mean variance optimal portfolio theory. So if you think about today's wealth, W0, let's say that's $400,000, you want to reach 500,000 at 10 years from now so that's this W here. And you basically have, let's say, a portfolio that you choose, which has got a mean return of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Okay, so that's the risk and return. 
And then in here, this is the standard sort of Brownian motion uh, you know, dynamics. Z here is just a normal random variable, standard normal. Okay, so, so obviously the evolution from W0 to WT is is not uh, not fixed or deterministic. It varies depending on how randomness evolves. And so this is a random equation. If I rearrange this random equation and put the mean on the left-hand side of the portfolio and the standard deviation on the right-hand side, then I basically have the return versus risk trade-off embedded in here in the light of these goals, because the ratio of WT to W0 is a statement of my goal that I want to go from 400,000 to 500,000 over time T. All right, so depending on the probability level I'm comfortable with, I, I get to pick Z naught. Z naught is basically the number under the normal distribution that I need. So for example, if I need 80%, I should pick Z so that the cumulative probability up to Z uh, is 80%. Okay, so I can pick the level of comfort probability that I want over here. And notice, I know W T, W zero and T, and now I've picked my Z naught. Let's say that's 80% target probability. Then to satisfy this equation, I can pick pairs of mu and sigma. Okay, so I get whole sets, infinite number of sets of mu and sigma pairs that will meet this. And so if I plot it in mu and sigma space, I will get a curve. So this line here are all pairs of mu and sigma with those uh, numbers we had before that will give us the 80% chance of reaching the goal. Okay, so we call this the GPLC or the gold probability level curve. You can see that if I picked a portfolio in here in the white region with a certain risk and return, that would be below the curve. And so it would have a less than 80% chance of meet, meeting the goal. If I picked one in the blue region up here, then it's gonna have a risk and return combination that has a better than 80% chance of meeting my goals. Okay, so that basically is a nice way of demarcating the portfolio space by the gold probability level curve. Okay, if I start choosing higher and higher levels of probability, the curve will swing upwards and it will make the space of acceptable portfolios smaller and smaller. And of course, if I reduce the, the my comfort probability and say, I'm okay with 70%, then you know there's a bigger set of acceptable portfolios. Now, obviously, if I'm above the 80% line, I'm happy if my choice probability is 80%, but then I've got all this range of area here, which are combinations of mu and sigma that can satisfy that goal. And I need to pick one portfolio that satisfies it. Of course, there may not even exist portfolios way up here that will do it. So there's gonna be a subset of this region that actually is acceptable. So let me just roll forward here. What I'm gonna do is this green line here is the efficient frontier that comes from Markowitz mean variance optimal portfolio theory. So I'm just assuming people know what that is. You've all taken your finance 101 class and you've seen the, um, the efficient frontier. So that green line is the efficient frontier. It is the collection of optimal portfolios or efficient portfolios that you get for each sigma, you cannot get a better return. Okay, so clearly an investor who is working properly and doing his job, he will basically want to sit somewhere on this green line. A high risk investor might want to sit higher up on the green line, a low risk investor will prefer to sit lower on the green line and have lower risk versus return. But if you take this 80% line, that's my goal probability curve. Notice that any point on the green efficient frontier that lies above the 80% line is acceptable to the investor. And so any, any of those would be fine because it would meet the, meet the goal-based uh, wealth management uh, requirements, but we can do better than 80% because I can actually rotate this blue line to the left until it has a tangent to the green line. Okay, so when I do that, I get the optimal probability point. So if I'm maximizing the probability of reaching my goal, I don't have to be happy with 80%, even though I know the investor likes 80% and would want to beat that. I can do better than that because the acceptable portfolios that are available to me allow me to rotate that blue line up to here and get this tangent. Now that tangent is actually for these numbers that I showed you is sitting at 86.6%. Okay, so when I max when I do this maximization, I can go up to 86.6% as the probability of reaching my goal. And so that's what I will do. I will say this is the portfolio you need because it maximizes uh, the chance of reaching that goal. Now notice if I change that 400,000 and 500,000 numbers, I'll get a different goal probability level curve and I'll get a different answer on the efficient frontier as to which portfolio I should use. 
But the second important thing to remember is that I will always pick a portfolio that's on the efficient frontier that best maximizes the probability of reaching my goal. So this way I have married both the goal-based wealth managing uh, objective with Markowitz efficient uh, portfolio theory because I always pick a portfolio that sits on the efficient frontier. Okay, so what I want to do now is take this geometry and actually solve this mathematically so that I have a, have a proper solution. And right now we are still in a static world, okay? We are doing everything as a one period problem. We're gonna extend that also to a dynamic problem. So suppose I take that equation that you've seen before where my goal is here, this is my initial wealth. And I rearrange it now to put the probability Z on the left-hand side. And notice we said they're a sigma and mu pairs. And so Z is basically a function of sigma and mu on the right-hand side. What I want to do is obviously maximize Z because the higher Z is, the greater my probability of reaching the goal is, okay? So this is the equation I want to maximize. I want to maximize this whole thing by picking a mu and a sigma on the efficient frontier, but there's a constraint. And the constraint is that mu and sigma must be on the efficient frontier. So it turns out the portfolio for, uh, the equation for Marco, it says efficient frontier is this. It's actually a hyperbolic equation. Uh, if you use variance, it's parabolic. If you use standard deviations, hyperbolic, uh, hyperbola. And so I call that G and A, B, and C are functions of the inputs to the Harry Markowitz uh, optimal portfolio problem. So what do we do when we solve the Markowitz problem? We put all the stocks we want, all their mean returns and the covariance matrix of their returns into the problem. And we go ahead and solve that problem. And so think of uh, this and A, B, and C as being, uh, uh, you know, uh, parameters that actually contain those. And I'm gonna show you those equations. And then mu and sigma are the mu and sigma of the different portfolios on the efficient frontier. Okay, because we are in two space. We are in basically sigma on the x-axis, mu on the y-axis. Uh, solve this with Lagrange multiplier. So I basically maximize this subject to this equation here. And lo and behold, the answer is actually pretty straightforward. I'm gonna jump straight to it. That's the equation of the efficient frontier, where A, this is the hyperbola, a is actually a function of these quantities, H and G. G and H are functions of these quantities, K, L, L, and M. And these are the basic quantities. So M is the vector of mean returns. So if I'm choosing from 100 stocks, then this is 100 vector of all the mean returns. Sigma is 100 by 100 covariance matrix of returns. And O is just a vector of ones, okay? It's a unit vector. And these, this is literally the answer to the Harry Markowitz uh, you know, efficient frontier. So if you want the efficient frontier, all you need to do is enter the, the mean vector, the covariance matrix and a vector of ones into all these quantities. And this equation here for every choice of mu and sigma will be the, the, the equation for the efficient frontier. So we wanna maximize Z subject to this equation with all these things in it. It turns out, and this is the first time anybody's done this, so this was all new for us. We actually get the solution to this as a cubic. Okay, and so we were surprised that a cubic fell out of this, this optimization problem. We hadn't expected a cubic to come out. This is sort of new. And so we had to dust off Cardano's formula, which I remember doing in high school to solve cubic polynomials and solve this thing. And it turned out that uh, you get two you get three solutions, obviously it's a cubic and two of them turn, turn out to have a mu as negative and one only as positive. So it turns out there's only one acceptable solution because we obviously don't want to use uh, negative mean return solutions. And the answer actually is quite clean and simple. Okay, so that was kind of nice and interesting. It was new. And so now we have a closed form solution to that problem where we marry goal-based investing with the, with the uh, Markowitz uh, mathematics. So this is the static problem. The entire story sits in here but what we wanna do is solve this dynamically. Okay, so when we wanna solve this dynamically, we want to actually solve it over time. That means I want to, at the end of time, let's say we're talking only of one goal right now, and I'm gonna extend it to multiple goals. So my goal is that my wealth at terminal time T should be higher than some goal level G. Okay, like we had, it should cross 500,000 in 10 years. Now, every year or every rebalancing period could be quarterly if you want, uh, we choose an asset mix and we change that asset mix as we go along so that we have the best chance of meeting our goals. So the best way to think about this is, let's say you're going to, you know, for dinner and you get on the road with your car and you're trying to reach there before a certain time. 
And if there's traffic, then what you know is that you're gonna to have to sort of change the speed and so on and so forth to get there. And obviously, you know, you can take a little bit, you can drive a little faster, but obviously it comes with risk that you might have a, a bigger chance of having an accident. And of course, if you're well on track, the traffic was extra light, un unexpectedly light, then obviously you don't have to drive that fast. You can take your foot off the accelerator a little bit. And so you're constantly changing the speed at which you're running that portfolio. And so these are the choices along the way. So every rebalancing period, you get to choose a different portfolio. Now, the way this actually works in practice is that people have model portfolios. So almost every wealth management company will have about 100 different model portfolios. Usually for, a, for each type of investor, they subset it down to 15, 20 portfolios because they're in a particular risk category, those investors. And then you can just think of it as a very simple problem that is every year, which of these portfolios should I choose uh, to go forward so that I meet this goal. So how do we solve this problem? We basically set up um, a dynamic programming problem and I, we don't have to go through all the details I'll give you the general sketch of it. But at the terminal, let's think of only one goal. At the terminal point, you have some wealth level and I has indexes all the different levels of wealth you might be at. That means you're gonna have to set up a grid to do this. At the end, if you're below the goal, you get zero in value. If you're at the goal or above it, you'll get one. Okay, so this is the value of that strategy that you're gonna in, uh, invoke. The value function is a function of the wealth at a particular point in time T and I indexes the, the level of wealth. Okay, so we go to the end. We know whether we were above the goal on the grid, we know whether the wealth level is above the goal. If it is, we put one, otherwise we put zero. Okay, so think of that as a probability of reaching your goal because if you're above the wealth level G, uh, then obviously you met your goal for sure, the probability is one. If you're below, you'll failed your goal for sure, your probability is zero, okay? So that becomes the end. And then you slowly work backwards. So here's how you work backwards. You start out at the end, you have all these. So let's say your goal was somewhere here. That means these four nodes will get a value function of one. All these nodes get a value function of zero. Now you go to this node over here. At this node, I want to know what's my expected value function going forward. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out the probability of going from this node to all these nodes over here. So all these transition properties I have to work out. Those transition properties are given by this equation, which is just a, tra a, a, a transformation of the wealth transition equation. So the probability of getting to node J at time T plus one from node I at time T, given that I chose a portfolio mu, is equal to this under the normal density function. Okay, so that's just simple mathematics. And so once I know the probabilities of going to all these, I can work out the expected value here, which is one times this probability plus one times this. So all these four are one, I multiply them by the probabilities of going there and these are all zero, so I can ignore them. I get the expected value function over here. And likewise, I get it for all these. Once I've got all these, I can work it back here. But the thing is a little more complicated because at this node here, let's say I have 15 different portfolios I can choose from. I'll do this calculation for all 15 portfolios and see which one gives me the highest value function here. And then I'll pick that particular portfolio. So I also figure out it as I work backwards, which is the most imp uh, important, uh, the correct portfolio to hold. Okay, so these are just, so dynamic programming is done with something called a Bellman equation. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take the value function at time t plus one for all nodes and multiply them by the transition property of going from at time t wealth level i to time t plus one wealth level j. And I sum them up across all these nodes. So that's the calculation I was just talking about. But I redo this calculation for all the different mu's from mu min to mu max. So I have portfolios with a very low risk with very low return, very high risk with very high return. There's a range, let's say, just think of 15 portfolios. Uh, I do this again and again, 15 times, and then I take the one that's the highest. So I keep track of which portfolio I would choose at that point in time and so on. Now notice I'm only optimizing over mu because once you show me mu on the efficient frontier, I already know which, what the sigma is, okay? So basically I have to choose over different uh, expected returns. That is the speed at which I'm driving this portfolio is a function of mu because that's the expected return. Okay, so that's the whole setup. And once I've worked the whole problem backwards, what I can do is because I have the transition properties and because I have the, I can start with the property of, of being at a particular wealth in the beginning, let's say I start out at hundred bucks, then the property of being there is one. Then I know the transition properties are going from there to the next period. I can work out what the 
uh, probability of reaching a particular wealth level at time t plus one is and so on. So I can work out going forwards, the probability of being at all the different wealth levels at every point in time under the optimal strategy. And so that gives me the complete picture of how this portfolio will go irrespective of whether it takes a high path or a low path, I know exactly what my strategy should be and what the probability of getting to those different places is. Okay, so turns out some with some clever coding and stuff, you can make this run really fast. You can do multiple goals, which I'm gonna show you now. You can scale the problem to do tax optimization, which I won't show you today, but there's work going on. Uh, just as a point of interest for us, uh, the US tax code is way worse. We always complain about the Indian tax law, but the US tax law is wildly worse than anything you will get in India, okay? So it's, it's India actually has done better in simplifying their code than the US has. So, so, so these are all different properties of this solution. Let's take a very simple example, okay? So one of the things people do is in the US, they think about three broad categories of assets. US bonds, US stocks, and international stocks, and they compose portfolios of these. So suppose we have a 10-year horizon, start out with 100 as the initial wealth, we want to get to goal 200. Turns out over the last a long period of 20 years, this is roughly the average return. So US bonds gave about 5%, US stocks gave about 9%, international stocks gave about 7% average, and that's the covariance of the annual returns as well. Okay, so we have this data. And if you converted this mean and covariance matrix into the efficient frontier, this is what it looks like. Okay, now this is a very simple efficient frontier. It's a low risk efficient frontier. Notice the return goes from about five and a half percent to about 9%, okay? So this is not very aggressive. And the risk goes from about 4% to about 20% standard deviation a year. The S&P in normal times is around 15 to 18%. Okay, the standard and poor's. Now today is about 30% because of all the chaos in the markets, but, but this is where it usually is. Okay, now if you take this, notice that the range of expected returns, the speed at which you can drive goes between five to about 9%. If you look at this, I want to take my money and go from 100 to 210 years, that's about 10% roughly speaking per year. It's even higher than this. So obviously there's gonna be not a 100% chance of getting there, it's gonna be much lower than that. But also remember that returns are random. So even though the, if I chose the high, high risk, high return of 9%, some years I'll get less than 9%, some years I'll get more than 9% because it's random, it's just, it's just the mean, right? So it's gonna be distributed around that. So there's gonna be a range of outcomes over the 10 years under the optimal policy, and we'll see what that is. So here's how we represent the outcomes. So notice this thing goes from zero to one. Okay, so these, every point over here is the probability of reaching the goal. So when we start out over here, we've worked the problem backwards and found that the solution, if I start out at hundred bucks, there's only a 66, two thirds chance of reaching that goal of 200 with, these, with, these, with this efficient frontier. Now, if in the first year the market does well and I end up over here, notice it's gotten darker. So immediately it's telling me my probability now of reaching that goal at the end is higher. At the end, Either I'm below the goal when I have probability of zero, I'm above the goal, I get a probability of one. Okay, and then there's a graded thing. Of course, if the, if the market start doing badly for a while, then I'm gonna be down here, my probability of reaching the goal gets worse, but it shows you the entire landscape of possible outcomes for the, for the portfolio. You can also work out at the beginning, right now we start at 100, notice that's just two thirds or 66% probability of reaching my goal. But you can also work out, because I've worked the whole problem backwards, I've got at every level of wealth, I know what the probability of reaching the goal is. So if I said, what if I put started with 150 bucks in my portfolio, then the probability of reaching my goal is almost 99%. But if I start with 125, I can get it up to about 85, 90%, and so on and so forth. So you can tell the investor, you want a higher probability than, than 66%, put a little bit more money in at the beginning, and you'll be able to do better. Okay, so these are all simple cases. What's the optimal portfolio strategy? I told you there were 15 portfolios, going from portfolio number zero to portfolio number 14. Okay, so zero to 14, there are 15 of these. When I start out, I'm gonna start with a pretty high risk portfolio. It's gonna be somewhere up here. And then if the portfolio does well, I can start taking risk off. Okay, because I once I've, I'm way ahead, I'm early. That's what you do, right? If you're early for dinner, you start slowing down. You say, okay, I'm going to get there. Why take more risk and drive faster? I'll just take my time and get there safely. But if I'm not doing well, I'm going to go into this region where I'm going to definitely start taking a lot more risk to get there. Okay, so that's the first thing it tells you. Now notice, this is the opposite of what people do. When the markets do badly, they start taking risk off. 
and 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 not catching up to their goals because they're frightened and actually they shouldn't be doing that because we know that the probability of not getting to your goal can not be damaged that badly okay so so that's basically the the quick story here now even if you follow a naive rebalancing strategy which is what let's say you decided i want a 70 30 equity bond mix and the market drops the 70 30 bond mix becomes a 60 40 just by accident, right? It's because your equity position has fallen. You're now sitting with a 60-40. So even if you rebalance back to 70-30, you would be taking a little bit more risk. Okay, so you would be implementing this portfolio. The only thing here is that this is solving the problem much more finely so that it tells you how much more risk you should be taking much more accurately than just go back to 70-30. Okay, so, so there's a little bit more fine tuning here over and above standard rebalancing. And I'll show you some results that talk to that. Okay, so let's look at a few things. We know that at a 10 year horizon, we get a, 60, uh, a 67% probability of reaching the goal. If I have a 15 year horizon, clearly I got more time to reach that goal and the probability keeps going up. Okay, so this is pretty intuitive and obvious. These are just checks on the algorithm. If I decide, this is what is interesting because it shows you the power of saving in a dynamic strategy. So if I invested just $1 more, I saved $1, per year in this in this strategy, I will actually go from 67% to 73%. All it takes is one extra, okay, per out of the 100. So 1% more infusion. If I infuse five a year, I go all the way up to 94% chance of reaching that goal, okay? So this is the power of putting a little bit of money in and letting it work dynamically over time. Obviously the opposite is true. If I take one buck out every year, <laughs> then I'm gonna drop my probability of getting to the goal as well, okay? So this is sort of try to show people that it's good to save and not you know, you know, know, tighten your belt when, when it needs to be done. So let's talk about how this strategy does for a classic problem. So suppose you've reached 50 years old. This is typical in the US, you get to 50 years old, that's the time when I don't, the medical system here catches you and makes you do a whole bunch of tests. And that's when you real, you sort of face your mortality in in the in, in by going to hospital for these tests, and then people say, "What about my retirement portfolio?" Okay, so suppose you've reached fifty, you only have a hundred thousand bucks saved up so far, and now you're worried that I'm going to retire in fifteen years at the age sixty-five, and then let's say I live another fifteen years till the age of eighty, will I remain solvent over that time? So I want to withdraw fifty thousand dollars a year, inflation adjusted from year 16 to year eight, uh, you know, for the next, uh, from year age 65 to age 80, and people worry about whether they can actually make it. Okay, so so here's the problem. Uh, and it's, so basically it's a lot more than 50,000 from year 16 because you're gonna be having inflation added to it. So what's the chance of this actually working out? Okay, so we compare that with the target date funds. Target date funds, this is the mix. So if you go to any of the big providers, Vanguard, Fidelity, uh, Schwab, uh, if you're age 50 to 54, they'll give you this mix. If you're age 75 to 80, they give you many more bonds and less. So they basically take your risk down. So we compared both these under the goal-based dynamically optimal strategy. If I decide to put in 15,000 a year from age 50 to 65, then the chance of withdrawing 50 a year inflation adjusted is 60%. That is remaining solvent at this withdrawal amount for till age 80. If you did the targeted funds only 20 cents, so about two and a half times less. Okay, and this is, it's completely obvious that this should, the targeted fund will do worse because they're not optimizing anything. They just have a time determined uh, portfolio strategy, whereas we are optimizing depending on where you are and how your portfolio is doing. So it should do better. The only surprise is how much better it does. It does drastically better than what a target date fund would do, okay? Same thing in a bear market, people do this all the time. So this is a picture of the last crisis. And you can see people take their money out when the market does badly, they put it back in when the market does well, and it's exactly the wrong thing to do. So if you run an experiment, and I'm going a little quick just to finish up. Uh, if you look at what happened, in all the big decline, market declines, the percent decline goes anywhere from 20 to 50%. The months of decline go from three months to you know one and a half years. But most of them within two years will recover by 75%. And within four years, all of them will recover 100%. Okay, so, so remaining in the market and not pulling your money out at the bottom is probably uh, intuitively obvious. 
but we just ran an experiment with the Great Depression. So this is the Dow from 1926 over time. Anyway, so three things you can do. You can sell stock in a bear market, which is a lot of people do and get out. You can maintain your stock position by rebalancing. So let's assume you have a 50-50 stock bond mix, you maintain it, or you can basically put more risk in when the market goes down, okay? which is our, our portfolio strategy. And it tells you how much to do that for. So if you compare these, just look at this over here very quickly. You can see that if you took your money out, then the 20 years from 26 to 36 would have gotten you from 102 to 104. You basically you know, kill yourself. If you basically rebalance, just go back every year to 50-50, you'll actually go from 102 to 175. So you'll almost increase almost by double over that 10 year period. But if you actually took a little bit more risk, you'll go from 102 to 262 over that period. Okay, so this is just, and we've run this for different types of bear markets and crashes, it pretty much works every time. And so it gives you a sense that this goal-based wealth management thing actually is supported by what we have in the data. So finally, I wanna show you multiple goals. Suppose you have many goals, and I'll do a very simple example here just so you see how it works. Suppose we have a 10 year horizon. I'm only looking at year 10. We only have a grid with three levels. Wealth is 40, 90 or 140 on, on our solution grid. And we have a bunch of goals. Let's say at year 10, we can take a goal. Let's say this goal is to buy a Tesla or some fancy car. And so it's 80, the cost of the car but the utility you get is 2000. So we put for the multiple goals, we put different weights on it. You can call them utility, you can call them anything you like. The weights is fine. But notice that if it costs me 80 and my portfolio is at 40, I, I can't get the goal anyway. So the value from that is zero. But this particular goal has a value to me of 2000. So if I take it, I get 2000. Now I wanna fill up the value function over here. Let's assume there are only two portfolios I can choose from. One has a probability of going to these three things of 70, 10, 20%. The other one is 25, 65, 10%. Okay, so they have different, depending on the portfolio I hold, they have different traversal properties to these three things. So I work out what's the expected utility on the first portfolio. So it's 2000 into 0.7 plus 2000 to 0.1 plus zero into 0.2, I get 1600. The second portfolio, 2000 to 0.25, 65, one, I get 1800. So clearly I should choose portfolio two over here. And I know the value function from that is 1800. So without going through the details, let's say we did this one and this one as well. We basically get 1950 and 1750 here. Now I've got this. What I have at year nine is another goal that cost me 50. Let's say this is some vacation or wedding or something that I'm, in, I'm doing. And the utility of that is only a hundred bucks. Now I, not, I need to know which to take. So let's go down to 40 here. Can I take the goal here? I can't because it's, I only have 40 bucks in my portfolio. It costs me 50. So nothing can be done. I remain at this uh, 1750 because that's the level of utility I have. Now over here, I can take this 50, right? So if I took that 50, I would get a utility of 100. If I take that 50, then 90 will drop to 40 because I'm spending it. And what's the utility at 40? It's 1750. So my total utility would be 100 plus 1750, which would be 1850. That's one choice. The other choice is don't forget about this goal, let it go. If I let it go, then I remain at 90 and the utility is 1800. So I have to compare 1850 with 1800. Clearly, I should take the goal and the value function is 1850. Let's do the final one. Here, if I give take the 50, I get utility of 100, but 140 drops to 90. At 90, it's 1800. So 1800 plus 100 is my total utility if I take the goal. If I don't take the goal, then I remain at 114 is 1950, so I shouldn't actually take the goal. So this is an interesting case where at a higher wealth level, in fact, I chose not to take the goal, whereas at a slightly lower wealth level, I chose to take the goal and it varies. So you have to do this at every point in time. So the algorithm becomes pretty dense because we are working back hundreds and thousands of, of levels of wealth. We are working back multiple goals and we're working back multiple portfolios. Here there were only two, but let's say there were 15. So we have lots and lots of combinations to work out. So all that takes some engineering, but it works out well. Okay, so we work this backwards every year. You can make this more complicated. Let's say at a single point in time on the same date, you could have three goals going on and each of those goals could be partial as well. So this could be a goal, let's say where you have to have some dental treatment. So it costs you seven, you get a utility of 10. So you either take it or not. So there are two choices here. Here there are three choices because you can 
take, uh, let's say this is to buy a, a, a fridge. So you can pay cheaper and get a cheaper fridge or pay 20,000 and get a better fridge, which has more utility. And, or you don't do it at all. So there are three choices here and here there are five choices. So two into three into five gives you 30 combinations. So seven plus the, you can take all the combinations and you get all these. Notice some are dominated. So for example, the 10 and four is dominated by 10 and 10, right? Because for the same cost, I get a higher utility here. So I take out all the dominated ones by cost. Then I take out all the dominated ones by utility and I get a smaller subset. But this means that at every node at that date, I have to check, should I take no goal? Should I take only pay seven and take 10 and so on and so forth. I work out all these combinations and go ahead. Okay, so the, portf the, the, the portfolio choices become more complicated. You can see the grid is not looking nice and smooth anymore because there are two goals here, one at five years, one at 10 years. The, the, the cost is 100 for taking the first goal, 150 for taking the second. As I change the utilities, I get different outcomes. So if I keep the utilities the same, thousand and thousand, the probability of fulfilling the second goal Okay, uh, the, the second goal is only 27% and 89% for the first one. Why is that? Because the first one actually costs less and gives you the same utility. Both of them give you a utility of thousand. But if I change it where I have the first goal only gives me a utility of thousand and the second gives me 3000. Now notice the probability of the algorithm will give me a probability of 91% of getting the second goal and only almost zero of taking the first one because this is three times the benefit of this. So it's gonna bypass the first one most of the time and take the second one and so on. Uh, let's take a very big financial planning problem and I'll end with this. There's a 35 year old couple with a five year old child and they are looking for a 60 year plan all the way out to nine, age of 95. They have the same 15 investment portfolios as before. They are starting with 100,000 now at age 35. They get a salary of 70,000 increasing at 4% a year until retirement age. So the last salary will be 265. And then also at age 30, at T equals 35, that means from 35 to 35, 70 years old, they will get social security payments of 120 increasing annually at 3%. So this is a classic problem that common people here have. Let's say they have four levels of goals. Tier one goals are the ones they really need to, need to satisfy mortgage, property tax, insurance, uh, everyday expenses. So you can see everyday expenses will be every year 60,000 for the year and growing at 3%, okay? So think of this as this one line has generated 60 goals in the problem right away over time. This line here has generated 25 goals. So we get hundreds of goals in this in this table. You have the second tier goals, which are orthodontics, goals, uh, four years of college for the kid. Uh, and notice that you can pay 40,000 if you have a portfolio is doing well, but in, if the portfolio is not doing so well, you'll drop it down to 20, funding the kid 25,000 a year and so on. Okay? And then you have house remodel, wedding, high school, paying for private school, trips, philanthropy, and so on and so forth. So when you solve this, you get the, uh, let me just jump over all this to give you the solution. So this is what the portfolio solution looks like. Okay, so it's telling you over time, which if you're doing really well, you'll be taking low risk portfolios, doing badly, you'll be taking high risk portfolios, but works out the entire thing for, for the next 60 years. This grid is more interesting because what it does is, oops, it shows you that for your tier one goals, the probability of getting to them is basically 99% because it's gonna make sure it gets these and ignore these, the algorithm will ignore those. For these, you can see, for example, college, it's 76 to 82 percent. That means it's four years of college here. So some years, one of the years must have been 76. The highest probability of which year was that would be 82 percent. And so you can see that. Now, for example, suppose you you say, look, you know, I would rather be, have a 90 percent chance of my kids going to getting funded for college. So I want to make this goal more important. I take this 900 utility weight and I push it up, let's say to 2000 or something like that. What it'll do is, the and resolve the problem, the algorithm automatically will make these properties higher, but obviously that's not free. You will have, to, you'll find some of the other properties will be you know, down, uh, downshifted for that reason, okay? Now, if you want to see how this looks, I, you can actually simulate paths through the solution grid. So this is a good path. The portfolio kept doing well, it started out at 100,000, it's reached up here like 3 million, dollars. And then of course you start expending. These are all the different goals we had. So you can see even uh, you have to read them from bottom up. 
and uh, so like the wedding goals will be this green one over here okay that's that's the wedding goal whereas the green one below is actually the everyday expenses so these everyday expenses are growing with inflation they the green one so they are the big component of everything but you can also see these orange tips over here the orange tips are those trips holiday trips that you want to make so you get all those on a good path uh, the property tax you can see is these ones that are being be made and over here you can see the high school is also being made the the red ones are also being picked up okay so it's a good path pretty much you get all your goals and everything goes well if you go to the bad path you can see it does well and then it starts it doesn't even get it goes a little bit above 2 million and starts dropping off notice all the trips are gone okay so there's no no holiday trips so you can see the difference if i do this between the good path and the bad path but even here in the bad path i'm getting a ton of these goals so I'm not really missing out on many of them okay so this is how the the strategy works out and it kind of does a pretty good job uh, dynamically optimally over time so i'm going to uh, skip over all this and uh, let me just go to the end and uh, so so goal based wealth management is not about optimizing performance versus benchmarks but about maximizing the probability that the investors reach their goals while remaining on the efficient frontier okay so it's consistent with mean variance optimization we haven't thrown away markowitz's uh, optimal portfolio theory it's extendable to non gaussian distribution as well that z in the model could be anything you could have fat tail distributions this this is not stuck with normal distributions uh, we've extended to mental accounts with multiple goals remember it is not glide path investing it's a glide surface it's not one size fits all it is highly customizable uh it's dynamic what we did also we experiment with static optimization what people do in practice what they do is every year they just redo the optimization as if it's a one period problem and keep going so having a sequence of static optimization rather than dynamically done uh it doesn't obviously doesn't do as well as dynamic portfolio optimization but the surprise was that it actually does pretty well it's only like 10% worse you know so so it means that even what people are doing today is not completely terrible it it's it's working fine we can adapt it to partial goals as well we've got an extension coming where we can have dynamic efficient frontiers because we usually see two regimes good econ economy and bad economy regimes and the portfolio sets that is efficient frontiers that investors can choose from can be different so we have a way of doing that it turns out you do a lot better if you actually account for the fact that the economy can go between recession and 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 normal times and so we should we should definitely be implementing that and then we do a lot of things with taxes and tax loss harvesting that i didn't didn't sort of show you over here okay so i'll stop you anirban just to leave some time sorry i ran a little bit over than what i intended you yeah. Thank you, Professor Das, for your uh, nice take. Uh, it's an excellent discussion, and uh, possibly it forces us to uh, go through the Markowitz portfolio model again under the this new model of goal-based wealth, wealth management. It's a new light, which basically forces us to see these things in a in a different way than we are traditionally used to, and it also shows how this this traditional theories can be optimized based on our you know requirements as as they keep on changing over time. and um, still shows you how we can stick to the principles and still do the to meet most of our goals um so to 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 start off of our q and a session um, i personally have a couple of questions that i would like you to okay know your view of, views on first of all is that uh, you personally have been working in the in the intersection area between finance and analytics for quite some time now how do you see this particular area developing both in terms of academic research as well as for the industry professionals right so so data science is sort of sort of the hot new buzzword that everybody has but interestingly in finance finance people came late to this game in the marketing academics and practitioners actually started using analytics way before you know trying to get you to buy things on you know, on the internet and optimize all that data they collected about you <laughs> in finance the fintech revolution is slowly bringing you know all this in as well so what's also happened is uh, big data and alternative data is becoming very important in finance so especially now with the pandemic so i've been talking to a lot of these finance companies and by the way i have another role at amazon i'm in the ml ai team at amazon and uh, one of the uh, one of the interesting things i've been seeing we talk to like big money managers or or wall street firms 
uh, they are very worried that all the time series data and the econometric methods they have been using are valid because if their world has structurally shifted with the pandemic then the histories of data that they have collected is kind of become less relevant so what has happened is people are moving on to using text natural language processing and uh, and voice so over here people will will record the voice calls for earnings calls with the analysts so when the every month the company has a earnings call they record those they try to see whether the tone of the voice has changed this month over the last four months and is that a signal uh, they're using a lot of text because text is more forward looking than time series data which is backward looking and so so a lot of that is happening and that is not what financial economists are usually trained to do so it's becoming more and more important that people learn how to handle massive quantities of data not only in numerical form but in in language form uh, another thing that is driving this is that last year 2019 was sort of the i would say the coming of natural language processing with something called bert okay so bert is this you know the thing that actually it's actually the thing that's used to complete your sentences in your gmail and all that so those language models are massive and they are being used a lot now by a lot of advanced financial firms as well and this is something that is bringing advantages so i think the domain of the data has changed and the domain of the techniques has changed uh, in terms of techniques regression models are what economists are usually comfortable with the problem with regression models is they're not very good predictive models just because you got a good t statistic on some variable actually buys you nothing even if you get reasonably high r squares it buys you nothing in terms of prediction prediction has to be done uh, turns out to be done far better with machine learning models by and large and so i think that's a, and we are seeing that a lot of finance professors now are slowly using machine learning tools the good advantage of this is that it's been democratized by a lot of open source packages and so it's not necessary you know the internal plumbing of each and every technique you can actually use them quite effectively once people understand the broad framework for it so i don't think there is any way for us to escape it as academics or as practitioners in finance because those who ignore it will probably be left behind i think it's going to be you know pretty critical for all of us to teach it and to use it in in the work we do okay um yeah that that is a very nice thing uh, yeah. what what do you see as as the next possible big change in, in this financial analytics domain yeah so i think the big the big change is going to be uh, multi multi modal data you know we are used to be using one type of data for a lot of our analysis but now combining voice text tabular image all these things has become kind of you know important so just in terms of that i mean i think the 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 nature of algorithms is also changing so how we actually use these is is uh, is drastically different now so if you went to high frequency traders in the old days they would look at streaming data and look at it now they are looking at things like images satellite images and throwing them into models the advantage of of machine learning and uh, a new wave of analytics is that it actually is quite compatible with multimodal data whereas if i if i asked you to take a regression model and feed it images and feed it text and feed it uh, numerical time series all at once and come up with a model that takes that's able to digest and ingest all this is not possible also the number of parameters that uh, we are dealing with now is is kind of crazy so you know regression models usually we are comfortable with 20 to 100 different uh, variables and coefficients and mm -hmm. and with these uh, so you might have you know 50 60 coefficients in the model now we are talking of hundreds of millions of coefficients you know so it's 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 super interesting where we reached which means explaining these models has become very difficult mm -hmm. so you know in regression it's easy to look at the coefficients say which ones are big and small and significant and whereas with this as these are all black boxes and so there's a lot of interesting work going on right now in explaining the black box the leading technique today is something called shap it comes from shapley values from the 1950s in game theory but that's what's being used actually to explain what these black box model do so i think we have to teach all this stuff to our students now and uh, and get everybody on on the same page uh the good news is in india there's a i think we are in really good shape in terms of the uh, the number of scientists and engineers that actually understand all this 
I think we are not in good shape is the intersection of that community with the finance community as of now. And that is, that is probably going to happen as well, because I think the finance companies I speak to in India are, are pretty cognizant of it, I think. So they will eventually be, be heading in that direction. But if, but if folks at IM are interested, I think, you know, just even websites like Analytics Vidya and things like that are extremely good. And it, it's pretty straightforward to actually teach some of this to, to our students as well. So I think FinTech is, is forcing finance and computer science people to come together and, and uh, you know, work on these things together. So I think that'll be, that's what we'll see. Sure. Uh, now I'd like to take up a few questions that I got uh, from some of the, our students. Sure. Uh, so if I can interpret this question in, in, in my personal view, uh, so there has been a huge influx of algorithmic traders in the current financial markets, whether mm -hmm. it's good for the, the market or the bad for the market is, a, is a, still a, sort of an open debate, depending yeah. on how, what your perspective is, if you're looking from the volatility part, whether you're looking from, uh, you know, whether these guys are informed, whether these guys are manipulating the market or they're providing liquidity to the market. Accordingly, I believe the, the our interpretation keeps on changing. But one thing that that possibly we can, we can uh, think about is, what happens to the regulators? As in, uh, yeah. how adapt are the market regulators to to view this, uh, or, or or how equipped are these market regulators to, to come up with a judgment on algorithmic trading, both in developed market as well as developing markets, as in India? What's sure. your view on that? Yeah. So so there's so the big two effects that algorithmic trading has created is that it increases liquidity, which is a good thing, but it also increases volatility. And it can increase the probability of wild crashes and swings because these algorithms don't realize the circuit breakers in the algorithms don't always work well. So you, you run into these once in a year major calamity, which is caused by these traders. So the regulators are focusing on two types of things. One is they're focusing on preventing that calamity from happening. And they haven't come up with a good way to do that because every algorithm might create go crazy in a, in a different way. So the way they focus on that is increasing the penalties for it, which is sort of, you know, prevent people from, from or force them to check the algorithm a lot better, hoping that that will work. The second way they're looking at is making sure these algorithms are fair. That is, they are fair to the non-algorithmic traders and they also fair within the algorithmic traders. So if you read books, you know, which talk about these things, uh, like Michael Lewis's book, you know, on, on this, uh, uh, as well, it's really about the the faster traders ripping off all the other, you know, slower traders and so on. And a lot of it is reached the physics. It, today, you cannot be in that business unless your execution time is under 10 milliseconds. You know, that means you have to get the signal and trade on in 10 milliseconds. So people put these boxes on the fiber optic cable at the NASDAQ. And you can pay more to move your box further up in the queue and so on and so forth. And all this has been creating unfairness. Regulators have been pretty good at that. They have kind of come up with ways to actually jam this by throwing noise, forcing noise to be thrown in there. Because we've got to the point where you and I can send a trade at exactly the same split second. And you might be the first in the queue and I might be the 10th in the queue because we are at this point where the physics has become so uncertain that you know it's, it's reached. So what they're doing is instead of, uh, instead of making it a physics problem, they're basically throwing enough noise in there to slow it down so that everybody gets a, a, a fair shake in this as well. So I think the regulators aren't bad at this. They're doing a pretty good job. I mean, the fact that we only get a few crises points with this is, is some sort of evidence for it as well. And uh, I'm not sure that it's actually something that is going to be a major problem simply because about five, six years ago in the US, this trading accounted for about 75% of trading volume. It's actually come down to about 55% of trading volume now. So the number of people engaging in this activity is not growing, it's actually shrinking. And the volume of it is shrinking as well, which means there's, they've hit a point where the gains are actually not physically not possible because of the physics of the of, of bit transfer and you know all the, all the communication uh, technology that we have. So, so I think, uh, Hopefully that gave some color to the question. I don't have a definite yeah. answer as you know, whether the regulators are doing it well or not. So, yeah, yeah it, it certainly yeah. does. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. In a related question, uh, so there is a view by, by some practitioners per se is that to create uh, alternative trading platforms, 
So as in uh, the algorithmic traders and non-algorithmic traders, they don't interact or the, they don't trade yeah, within yeah. themselves. They're trading different platforms altogether. What's your right. view on that? Do you think that's a, that's a mechanism that that should be better, or do you think that's not something? I think it's a mechanism that should be permitted, and whether it's better or not will get determined by the traders themselves. So in the U.S., we've already had that experiment where alternative exchanges got created. Uh, the first one was the Arizona Stock Exchange, which was a long time ago. It went, it was just a computer in the desert in Arizona. They set up an installation there and they did that so that the commissions that New York Stock Exchange was charging could be dropped by one fourth. And so they actually, a lot of the big players went over there because they didn't want to pay commissions to NICE. And then uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange filed a lawsuit saying this is splitting the order flow. And so markets are less efficient because information is now getting distributed and not centralized. And this is not a good thing. So the SEC kind of you know muddled their way through it, but it didn't stop the growth of these alternative exchanges. And the the what people often point to as the dark side of this is the dark pools. You have all these dark pools of trading where nobody knows. Information is literally going into a black hole and is not getting shared with the market. So if a lot of the order flow goes away to those markets, I think the only thing the regulator needs to do is make sure those markets are transparent in terms of uh, you know the information flow and the prices that are revealed on those exchanges. Uh, to that extent, then having them in separate places is actually better because if you're if those new exchanges are lowering the cost of transactions, then it, uh, everybody gets to play at a lower price. Of course, it hurts some brokers and things like that for sure who are collecting, you know, in in today's markets. But but uh, but yeah, as long as the information ex exposure is still there, I think having multiple exchanges has been proven to be a fairly good experiment. Uh, it also tends to be a place where risk can be compartmentalized. So if one exchange goes down, it doesn't damage all the other exchanges. So splitting the order flow has some risk benefits. As long as the information benefits are not lost, you know, it should be it should be something that can that can work. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah. We are running out of time, so I'll just have one final question. Uh, any any particular advice that you think uh, that would help our uh, MBA finance students in, in their career? Yeah, I think I, I would just say that the right thing to do today is to is to take uh, uh, create and take more analytics classes. It's certainly you can do a lot of self learning also. Uh, it's becoming kind of a, a entry a table stakes, you know, to get into this into a sort of more modern uh, finance. Uh, the world is going to change, I think, automatically. Technology is going to drive more and more of this. The reason it's driving it is because it's reducing costs a lot. All the big players are are really hurting. In the wealth management industry, for example, the fees are are vanishingly, uh, you know, getting impacted. I mean, this uh, heavy fee compression right now. So all these players are either going to be out or they're going to have to operate at no fees. In the U.S., it's already gone. Trading fees have gone down to zero, basically. And uh, wealth management fees, the robo-advisors are doing it at one-eighth the fee that if I went to uh, Fidelity, I'd pay one and a half, two percent a year. Uh, you can go to a robo like Betterment and get, uh, you know, 0.25 percent a year fee to do exactly the same thing. So, so all this is technology-driven. So taking a mix of technology, analytics, coursework, along with finance coursework, I think is important. Uh, I tell most of my students here that you should, your minor should either be in mathematics or computer science. You know, your major can be in finance. And uh, this, that's, that's pretty much where it's going. <clears throat> and I don't mean you have to be a PhD or anything like that. I think it's just, it's uh, the good thing about the old world on Wall Street was like in derivatives, sophisticated people had to have a PhD. There was no way a, a MBA could compete with those guys. Now I think MBAs can compete by learning analytics because it's democratized. You can actually pick up 80, 90% of that really well without having a deep computer science background or a deep mathematics background. You can actually do quite a lot if you put in the time and, and play with uh, different models that are available. Read the blogs on Medium and Hacker Noon and you know all these other places that are there. And teach yourself Python and R because that is kind of you know the, the language of all this right now. They are very easy languages to learn. And so uh, I think that's where you know people should be focusing. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Sanjeev, sir, for the insightful session. You're we are grateful. We are grateful to you for taking some time out of your excruciating schedule and sharing your thoughts and research with us.
I'm sure all of us will leave the session feeling enlightened and more knowledgeable about the personal wealth management. Thank you again for your time and contribution, sir. Thank now, you. Good luck and it's good to meet everybody. Thanks a lot. Now I request everyone to please stand up for the national anthem. All the best for the rest of the series. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's wonderfully organized. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.